You can piece them before I open them. <laughs> You're not doing a good job of cooperating. <laughs> Maybe you better be pleased. Brenda, Brenda, we're live. You should wear the deodorant. She's not sitting right. here. Oh. I know. Okay. I'm starting to take it personally. We're going to go to James tonight. Somebody was teasing me about me not wanting to switch it up, so I'm switching it up. Okay, where are you going? Not that I'm falling to peer pressure, but I had this planned anyway, and I just heard the Holy Spirit say, do it today. I didn't do it. We're going to James 1, and if you're not there quickly, you're going to miss it. Peace it's a quickie. A, a peace with Satan. My opening prayer scripture tonight is James 1.5, and it's short and it's sweet, but it is very profound. <laughs> and it says, if any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God who gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly, without reproaching or fault finding, and it will be given to him. So Father, I just open up the study tonight, I open up the floor, I ask you to speak through our vocal cords and think through our mind, all of you and none of us, Father, and I just thank you for opening up your word for wisdom and for revelation and for knowledge and for understanding and for comprehension, that we would rightly divide it yes. so that we can apply it and experience great success in life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. Okay, last week we started chapter 7. And we um, the, we just read the first what I think oh the first two sections, and we learned that when Jesus died on the cross, his sacrifice for sin was once and for all. So in the Old Testament, before Jesus, they had to give annual sacrifices to cover sin, and when Jesus died on the cross, he, his sacrifice was the final sacrifice for sin, and it and it. Um, it not only covered, but it purged. It purged our sin. So we, if you receive Jesus as your Savior, then you no longer have to worry about sin because Jesus took care of it on the cross. When he, in fact, yes, yeah, let's, let's read that scripture. Um, Romans 6. I'm going to start at 3. Are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by the baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead... I'm not reading out of the Amplified. Let me move over here. Um, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him and the, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the gift that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, that took care of the sin problem. And if Jesus is your Savior, then it took care of the sin problem for you too. Okay. Then we talked about... What page? Um, I'm just kind of reviewing the first half of the chapter in chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Then we talked about being sin conscious versus being righteousness conscious. And we talked about how, um, or I just gave a testimony of how I used to focus more on the negative things, like when I wasn't meeting the standard or I wasn't doing enough or I wasn't performing to the place that I thought I should be or other people thought I should be. It, it's that was my focal point. So it affected me emotionally, it affected me mentally, it affected my health probably, and I was just always feeling like I just wasn't good enough. Or I, what's that word I used last week? Uh, uh, it starts with an I. Um, inferior, inadequate. 
Inadequate. Inadequate. That's the one. Thank you. Inadequate. <clears throat> and it stole my peace, right? Mm -hmm. But now that I understand that, um, that my righteousness according to God or the way that God sees me or the, to the degree that God is pleased with me has nothing to do with my performance and everything to do with the fact that he has made me righteous. So it's nothing about me and everything about the workmanship that I have been created in Christ Jesus. It's his workmanship. He's pleased with his own work that he did in me. And he's pleased with me for, for participating in that by an act of my will. So that's the only thing that I had to do was an act of my will to join in this process. And so um, that was all that was required of me. So now moving forward, I can fall short or I can meet the standard, but to, in his eyes it doesn't matter because he sees me from through the righteousness of God. And that's, I have met the standard. So when you can make that transition from being sin conscious to being righteousness conscious, it completely changes your life because you, it totally just sets you free. And it, it allows you to live a life of joy and peace and not get so wrapped up in the deficiencies. I'm just going to read this paragraph. Um, I am in the once section, mm -hmm. the third paragraph. New Testament believers need not be conscious of sin. The Old Testament sacrifices couldn't do it, but the New Testament sacrifice could and did. If what he means by that sentence is, and they couldn't not, they couldn't in the Old Testament, this is a double negative, I realize, but they couldn't not be conscious of sin because every year they had to go and witness and bring forth a sacrifice to be reminded that you are, you still have sin and this action is a cover for your sin because you're in covenant. So they had to be reminded of their sin continually. They were under the law. The law pointed to their sin and that they weren't good enough and that they're, they could never meet or fulfill the perfect requirement of the law. So the, the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't do it, but the New Testament sacrifice could and did. If you believe the truth of God's word, you can literally reach a place where you are no longer sin conscious. You would recognize that your spirit has been sanctified and perfected forever. God doesn't see you as a sinner. He sees your born-again spirit and is pleased. If you focus your thoughts on who you are in your spirit, you'll be conscious of righteousness. So like that takeaway was last week or the week before, you're a masterpiece because there's a piece of the master within you. Mm -hmm. You'll become more associated with that identity than with your performance in your flesh. Okay, and then we got to... The question I left you with last week, and this is this idea about forgiveness. And I brought forth a couple of scriptures in Matthew, and I think I gave you one in Luke and one in Mark too, where basically the message was, darn it, hold on, I got to go back there. If you don't forgive others, the Father won't forgive you. Yep. And the question was, are we forgiven? So the condition is, or what the condition appears to be in Matthew is, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So it appears as though forgiveness, according to this scripture, is conditional based on your action. If you forgive others, God will forgive you. If you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. So we address this idea that the context of this was Jesus speaking to the disciples in the Old Testament before the cross. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and the question was, so what's true? Like Brenda just said, did the sacrifice of Jesus forgive sin once for all, past, present, and future, or does this condition still, is it still alive and well? Like, do we, are we still required to meet this condition in order for, for God to forgive us? So I opened up that floor for you to think about that for the week, and now is your opportunity to submit any thoughts you have on that. I think your spirit man probably knows the answer, but can you articulate it, and can you give me a scripture to back it up? 
Mark 3, verse 28 and 29. 3, did you say? 3. Okay, hold on, I'm going to go there. Okay, go ahead. It says, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. And what is that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Not accepting Jesus as your Savior. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, that's a good, that's a good example. It, clearly this verse says, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men. I think in the same section, it says even if you if you speak against um, Jesus, that would be forgiven, just not the Holy Spirit. Um, okay, so that's valid, but it still that scripture still seems to contradict the two Matthew six fifteen and Matthew eighteen thirty four that says, I receive what you're saying and I agree with you. There are many scriptures that point to that you've been forgiven, but how do we say? Well, all these scriptures say you've been forgiven, but these two scriptures say it's conditional. God won't forgive you unless you forgive others. Okay, I'll give you one more to look at. This is Matthew 9.5. So this is Jesus, Jesus healing the paralytic man that was brought to him. And instead of saying, well, he did eventually say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But first he said, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And of course, the scribes had a problem with that, the Pharisees. They're saying this man blasphemies. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. So, again, the context here is Jesus talking to Old Testament saints. This is before the cross. So why would Jesus teach on the parable of the mount, or I'm sorry, on the Sermon on the Mount, when he was giving the Beatitudes and he said, gave two examples, if you do not forgive others, my Father will not forgive you, if he had the power even before the cross to forgive sin. Do you see how it seems contradictory? If Jesus had the power to forgive sin, which he declares right here, and this is before the cross, and the conditional statement says, if you do not forgive others, my Father will not forgive you. But he had the power to forgive sins even before the cross. Then how can that condition be true if it also says all your sins have been forgiven? Even David in the Old Testament said, blessed are those whose sins are forgiven whose iniquities are covered and whose sins are forgiven. I know I'm just like wrapping your brains up into a big fat knot. Okay, well, I'll just give you, I, I don't claim to have this fully figured out myself because I'm not 100% um, settled with my answer, but I can give you a partial answer. And so my partial answer is in the context of spirit, soul, and body, which is why I even brought this up, mm -hmm. is when we think about our spirit, our soul and our body, in which three of those sectors does unforgiveness reside? Soul. <laughs> soul. Mm -hmm. I would say soul, not in your spirit. Right. It's an act of the flesh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in the light of this study, spirit, soul, and body, our spirit is still sanctified and pure and, and protected and free from sin. So I say that all sins are forgiven because if you've been made the righteousness of God in your spirit, man, that's the only requirement in order for you to go to heaven, right? So if you still carry sin in your body and in your soul, which we all know we did, we covered this in 3 John, that doesn't preclude you from being forgiven of sin and going to heaven. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense so far? I guess that's the only thing. I had one other thought, but that really doesn't make any sense. So that's the only thing that I can find to reconcile why Jesus would say, if you don't forgive others, my Father won't forgive you. But then we see in the New Testament, in several places, and even in the Old Testament, that all your sins are forgiven, that the sacrifice of Jesus was sufficient 
to fulfill their, their perfect requirement of the law. So the only way I can reconcile it is by saying unforgiveness is sin that's held in the, in the soul, and we are not, sin is not imputed to us if it's in our soul or in our body if you are born again because your spirit man has been made the righteousness of God. Right. Does anybody else have anything else to say on that? Or do you, are you, if you look at Peter, what did he say? You are the son of a living God. And he said, you didn't get that from anybody. You got that from the Holy Spirit. Then on the other hand, then he gets in the garden, and then what does he do? He speaks against it. He denies it. And he says, Satan, get behind me. Soul, what is that? That's your soul speaking. Mm -hmm. But his spirit knew he was the son of the living God. He knew who he was. Mm -hmm. But his soul was going to speak then. Mm -hmm. So you can have that. But still, he was speaking to people before the cross. And I look at it, that they always say, you have to rightly divide it. Who is he talking to? Mm -hmm. Who is he forgiving? Who is he not? Who, who did he have to say that to? Who are the people? Mm -hmm. where, where, who was he dealing with at that time? That's how I look at it. Which I totally, and I remember that you brought that forth on Thursday morning, mm -hmm. and that's why I brought forth this Matthew 9, because this is also Jesus speaking before the cross to people that hadn't been made the righteousness of God yet, but saying that he had the power to forgive sin. And then you look at Jesus when he was on the cross, and people can look at it, and he says, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? People are thinking, oh my gosh, God's forsaking him. You know, you can look at that too. People have come and said that to me. But again, that you got to look at the context that it's in and why it was sad. That's my opinion. Okay, I like it. Well, we're going to move on. I think what we have to remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are old and new. Yeah. And when it's in the old, Jesus could forgive, but after the cross, we're forgiven. It's like the fig tree. There you go. Yeah. It wasn't his time. That it, it, I look at it that way. The fig tree was doing the wrong thing, but it wasn't wasn't his time. He had to die. That had to be done. It wasn't Jesus' time yet. And you know, I used to get confused about this. This is a long time ago about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I would think if Jesus said it there, it's etched in stone. But I did not realize it was before the cross, so it was the Old Testament, because he had to fulfill the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he had to lay that all out first, and then comes the New Testament, like praying our Father is in the Old Testament. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now we have got it. So he fulfilled the Old. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? So in the old, he has the power because he's been given it by the Father. He gives them the power so they can go out and, you know, so on and so on. But are they impelled with the Holy Spirit yet? No, they're not born again yet. Yeah. So it, it's really simple if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Before the cross and then after the cross. After the cross is completely different than before the cross. You have to rightly divide it. Yep. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. Good questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does everybody, does that sink in? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm still looking at where he said, if you don't forgive, my father won't forgive you, which is the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, yeah, and now it's now. <laughs> that that you for me. <laughs> it's a part of fulfilling the old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's delicious. Yes, my dear. Uh, I was just going to bring forth the scripture here. Um, I think it's this one in. Hebrews. I'm just looking what verse it is. Okay, um, I think it is not uh, Hebrews 9, 24 through 28, and he kind of quotes it here in this section once. Um, 
first paragraph. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have, to su have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that took for him, that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I guess that wasn't the perfect one I was looking for, but but it just goes to show that this was the this was I don't know who's speaking here, but probably uh, Paul I would guess. They were just he was trying to explain probably to the Jews who were used to this idea of these annual sacrifices that with, that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is different than these annual sacrifices that they were accustomed to because Jesus only had to die once because it wasn't just a covering for sin, it had now completely purged sin. And they had priests go into the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. Now he is the high priest above all right. those. Amen. Mm -hmm. Right here, Allie, it says in 10, it says, but every priest stands daily, ministering and repetitively offering the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had suffered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. So it's finished. So the case has been decided. Mm -hmm. If you have Jesus as your Savior, as the scapegoat of your sins, then you are forgiven. Mm -hmm. There's no condition except that you have Jesus in your heart. Isn't, isn't that freeing though? Just think, you mess up royally. Even before you say, I repent, you're forgiven. Amen. You see, you can't wrap your mind around it because you're not used to dealing with your parents and other people like that. Because, you know, um, let's say you kicked me a week ago. <laughs> I her, she'll kick me again, and I'll go over and hash that over. Jesus said, that's dumped into the deepest of oceans. Even if she would do it to me again, it's dumped into the deepest room. But this time, I'm going to get her back. <laughs> oh, in the parking lot. <laughs> oh, in the parking lot. <laughs> some moves you could take me over. <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> I can't wait to get to the parking lot. <laughs> I don't know how good my moves are, though. <laughs> I think she's psyching you out. <laughs> <laughs> so this next section, past, present, and future, is just another layer um, to add on to the discussion we just had. That um, this idea that the once for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross could reach to past sins of the Old Testament saints, any present sin that you're committing right now, and any future sin. So this idea that if you don't forgive others, then God cannot forgive you. But if Jesus' sacrifice already forg forgave my future sins, then mm -hmm. it's already covered, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So let's read, Debbie. Okay. You've been forgiven of your sins, past, present, and future. That's what eternal redemption means. You might think that God can't forgive me of a sin before I even commit it. Well, you better pray that he can because Christ not only died for your sins once. Mm -hmm. If Jesus can't forgive a sin before you commit it, then you can't be forgiven at all. Why? Jesus Christ hasn't died, has hasn't died for sin in over 2,000 years. Jesus paid for all sins, past, present, and future. Humans may not think this way, but God does. He's eternal. Time, distance, and space are problems for him. Through his perfect sacrifice, God has already dealt with all sins. When Jesus died, he put a will into effect, by the which will are we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 10, 10. You were sanctified, separated, made holy through the offering of Jesus Christ once for all time. Generally speaking, Pentecostals were the ones who came up with this doctrine of backsliding. That every time you sin, you lose your salvation. And if you don't confess it before you die, then you'll go to hell despite the fact that you've been born again for 20 or 30 years. They erroneously 
uh, inter interpret this verse to mean one sacrifice for all people. However, the context proves that Hebrews 10.10 10 means one sacrifice made you holy for all time. Notice all the words refer referring to time in the next four verses. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expect, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he made perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10, 11-14. Christ's one offering perfected and sanctified you forever. In case you still aren't convinced, Hebrews 12, 23 is another verse from the same context. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of men, of just men made perfect. How clear can it get? Your spirit has been perfected forever, all time. You don't lose your right standing with God if you sin. What a radical, wonderful truth for the church today. Amen. Thank you, Carl. David saw it. Most Christians are taught that their performance affects their relationship with God. When you are born again, you're forgiven, cleansed, and you become a brand new person. However, every time you sin, you lose that right standing with him until you confess that particular sin and put it under the blood, too. If you don't, Jesus is displeased and cannot accept you. If you were to die before repenting and confessing all of those sins, you would go to hell. In a sense, you're saying that you must be born again, again. That's not what God's word teaches. The Bible speaks of eternal redemption and eternal inheritance. You aren't sanctified and perfected only until you blow it, which is constantly. You're sanctified and perfected forever. People who believe they lose it all and have to start over again every time they sin will never really develop or see great growth in their spiritual lives. They're stuck in the flesh, focused on the performance of their bodies and their souls. God's word reveals that your sins were forgiven past, present, and future. David saw by faith through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit just how great salvation would be. Even as David also described the blessedness of a man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered, past and present tense sins. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not, future tense, impute sin. Romans 4, 6 through 8. Paul quotes Psalms 32, 1 through 2. Psalm 32, 2 even adds, and in whose spirit there is no guile. David, an old covenant patriarch, saw prophetically the blessedness of your new covenant relationship with God. Because of your born-again spirit's righteous nature, the Lord no longer holds any sin against you. Now that's good news. Amen. Um, I want to keep going just in this first section. I don't know why they made the chapter break here, because this next section really ties into what this end of this discussion. But I want to just point this out. Um, this is in the second to last paragraph. People who believe they lose it all and have to start over again every time they sin will never really develop or see great spiritual or great growth in their spiritual lives. They're stuck in the flesh, focused on the performance of their bodies and their souls. Um, why is it that people in this condition, like I used to absolutely 100% be, why won't they ever um, really develop or see great growth in their spiritual lives? sentence, I'll just read it again. People who believe they lose it all and have to start over again every time they sin will never really develop or see great growth in their spiritual lives. They're stuck in the flesh, focused on the performance of their bodies and their souls. Because you're always looking back. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're trying to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, which is perfection, which you can't do. So it's just like in the Old Testament where God defined the perfect standard. The purpose of the law wasn't to help the Old Testament saints overcome their sin because they could never do that. They were kind of um, like a dog chasing their tail. They're you're just never going to catch it. You can't ever attain it. That's the whole purpose of the law was to point to the iniquity in you 
and show you that you need Jesus as a Savior, because he did fulfill the perfect requirement of the law. So people who are in this state of mind, always trying to outperform themselves or do better or whatever, overcome things in the flesh, they'll never get there because they're trying to do something they don't have the capacity to do. So, okay, let's read the first chapter, first section of chapter 8. Standard gospel questions. Serious questions usually start coming right about now. What are you saying? God will love me and I won't lose my right standing with him no matter what? Do you mean I can just go live in sin? Paul dealt with the same thing. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The answer, of course, is God forbid. Romans 6, 2. Unless this question comes up, you aren't preaching the same gospel as the Apostle Paul. He dealt with it four different times. What, I have, what am I saying? Do we continue to sin? God forbid. Even though you have to explain what you mean, it should be a logical question. Nobody interprets that churches today are saying you can just go live in sin because you're busy preaching so hard against it. This question never even comes up. Typical teaching today ties God's love and acceptance to your performance. Therefore, these messages given in the name of the Lord produce a, work, a works righteousness, self-righteousness based on your actions in most believers. The Bible doesn't teach that God accepts or rejects you because of your actions. It teaches that your actions can never be good enough. God's word says he accepts you based on whether your spirit is righteous or not. That spirit doesn't become righteous through the good, your good actions or attitudes. Righteousness comes through confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. As you are born again, God gives you this brand new spirit. Righteousness is not based on your actions. Mm -hmm. The next question people ask is, are you saying it doesn't matter how I live? No, that's not what I'm saying. Paul continues in Romans 6 giving two reasons why a Christian should live holy. One, your new nature desires it. And two, you don't want to give the devil access to your soul and body through sin. Mm -hmm. How you live doesn't affect your spirit's righteousness, but it greatly affects your life. Why? Because it affects your soul and your body. How? Because if you live in sin, then you have, then like it said here, Satan has the right to come in and to wreak havoc in your life. Can you give me an example? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, if you robbed a bank, you couldn't get caught and go to jail. Okay. I thought yours was going to be on sugar, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> if you eat too much sugar. I actually system? thought of you the other day. Levi got yeah, beer and bought Levi this um, bubble tape, I think it's called. And uh, he said, here, Mom, you want some? And I didn't really want some, but I just took some because he was offering it. And I was chewing it, and I was like, oh, man, this is so strong. i got to spit it out because it was just, like, so, so sweet, and I couldn't even handle it. And I thought, oh, my gosh, if there was a way to torture Judy, this would be it. Make her chew this <laughs> out. <laughs> she would do it. She would do it. I was just imagining if, if Judy was in a situation where there was a gun to her head and she had to chew this gum, what her facial contortions would be chewing this gum right now. <laughs> so you were on my mind. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so so if a smoker um, knows that smoking is going to harm their lungs and harm their body and they could develop cancer and they could die early of cancer and not see their children and grandchildren's lives play out, is that God's fault? Did God cut their life short? No. No, no we have to take personal what was that? What was that word? Oh, louder. Accountability. Uh, accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have something? No, I said accountability. Nice. You, you know what? When, when my brother Daryl died of AIDS, my, a family member of mine said, why did God do that? God did. Did you hear that? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, God didn't do that. Yes, he did. Ooh. I thought I better shut up because I'm gonna die physically. <laughs> well, even when Amanda posted on her Facebook Facebook page about the twins passing away, everybody's like, "Well, God took them early." I'm like, "No, He didn't." Yeah. Like, how can you write that? Mm -hmm. that that's that's a 
form of mm -hmm. blasphemy too because you're calling good evil. Mm -hmm. it, you know, when you're thinking, mm -hmm. now when we look back at where we used to be, where I, I, I'll just say where I used to be, mm -hmm. you know, thinking you got to be this good little girl and you have to make your confessions and if you do something wrong, go light a candle. Well, I left the Catholic Church. I can't light a candle anymore. <laughs> Look, they, they took all the nets away from jumping in, you know. But it really, it, can you imagine, this is what I was imagining today. How, how the disciples, the Pharisees and Sadducees, all of those, here comes Jesus and we're transferring from the Old Testament to the New. Can you imagine what was going on? They were taking away something that they cherished. Think about that. Well, it was God given to them also. Yeah, but they yeah, couldn't. The only thing they could see was the past. They were looking out right. in the rear view mirror. Right. Can you imagine that? Because I know it, being a Catholic, that was very difficult. That was very difficult to look through the front window instead of the rear view You know, that was because you kept on going back. Didn't anybody else? Whenever there's a change in routine, I mean, even I think about Daddy when told us to switch our seats where we were sitting. <laughs> People get kind of it's antsy <laughs> when you have to change the routine. Yeah, that's a true. different thing. Yeah. It's a different yeah. habit. Yeah. It's a different way of thinking. Take a, and move the furniture around in your house and see some of the people that live in your house. Mm -hmm. Woo! You know? <laughs> They're ready to sit down. <laughs> I remember when we re did some remodeling and we changed the traffic flow from the garage it used to go one way and now we changed it. It took me a couple of months to remember, oh, if I make that straight, I'm gonna hit my shoulder on the doorway. Like it moved, like I have to move my pants. Like your body just learns, you know what I mean? It just learns how to navigate and you just do it second nature. And so I remember it was a challenge in the beginning to walk around the wall now because there's not, a, you know, anyway. Yeah, so. And then it's changing people's status. How are you doing it? Oh, like the priest, it was changing their status now. Now that they have Jesus to rely on, never, everyone's not relying on them, uh, making them the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. There was jealousy, envy, everything going on inside of there. Uh -huh. And remember, who was this Jesus? He was born here. Look at You know, he's just an ordinary guy. What are you guys doing? But they did not look at the miracles. They look at the miracles because what he did on the Sabbath so then they become angry because you're not supposed to work, you're not supposed to have a bone movement on the Sabbath. That's how, it's 613 laws. You could only make so many steps that day. If you made, oh, you'd have to stand there. You couldn't even backtrack. Yeah. I mean, it was, that's what man does. We add, we add and we add. <laughs> but anyway. Okay, so righteousness <laughs> comes through confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, period. That's it. Amen. That's where righteousness comes. It's Amen. not based on your actions. Amen. So all this commonplace doctrine that you should live holy because um, God's love and acceptance is based on your performance is totally wrong. His love and acceptance is only based on the idea that you have received the free gift of righteousness through Jesus Christ. That's it. If you've done that, you can check the box. God is pleased with you. Amen. Amen. Um, so, but, so is there still a reason for us to live holy? Yes, there's two reasons. One, because now your nature has changed. Yeah. So you desire to live holy. In the army, they used to always say, or I remember this saying, um, do the right thing even when no one's looking. Mm -hmm. And also do, it, do what's right because it's right. And that's always been my, you know, one of my uh, soapboxes or idioms that I always tell my kids is do what's right because it's right. You should have no other reason to do the right thing except that because it's the right thing to do. You know, so um, if you have been made the righteousness of God, you desire to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Like, it's just integrity. And then the other reason is to cut off the devil's access to steal, kill, and destroy in your life. So the more that you are doing the right thing, the less he has any access to mess with you. I'd like to read one more section if we can because it's really good and it just really flows really well with the same you know, topic, and I don't want to chop it if we don't have to, and I think we've got enough time, so go ahead, Debbie. Sin's strength. If you are truly born again, God has changed your nature. How shall we, that we are dead to sin, live any longer therein? 
Know ye not that so many of us, were all, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Romans 6, 2 and 3. Are you no longer a child of the devil who loves to sin? Oh, you are no longer a child of the devil who loves to sin. You still, you do still sin, but it's not your nature anymore. Your spirit has been changed and you no longer enjoy it. Every born-again believer has a built-in desire to live holy. 1 John 3, 3. You might not be fulfilling it, but it's there. Preaching the law, legalism, <coughs> and religious works actually strengthens sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The law makes you sin more by causing you to lust for the very thing that's forbidden. That's why God gave it. Mankind was being destroyed by sin, but we deceived ourselves into thinking, I'm pretty good. God answered saying, oh, you think you're okay. Let me show you what the real standard is. The law made sin come alive so you'd recognize your need for a savior. Romans 7, 9, Galatians 3, 24. Since I can't give a detailed explanation of this truth here, I'd like to recommend to you the true nature of God. In that teaching, I expound much more on this particular point. You'll discover how God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8, can act so differently toward mankind from the Old Testament to the New. Without understanding how everything changed when Jesus Christ came, you'll think God is schizophrenic. I assure you, he's not. <laughs> The Lord's purpose in sending the law was to make you bow your knee and confess, God have mercy on me. I can't do it. I can't break the sin. The law wasn't given to help you overcome sin. It was to show you that sin had already overcome you. Can you read that again? The law wasn't given to help you overcome sin. It was to show you that sin had already overcome you. The law actually strengthened sin and gave it so much power that it would effectively remove the deception that you could ever get rid of sin on your own. Religion, however, turns it around and says, the law was given to help you overcome sin. That's just not true. If you're truly born again, you have a desire to live for God, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. 1 John 3, 3. There will be a varying degrees of this purity manifest in your actions and thoughts, but every born-again person seeks to purify themselves. Sin gives Satan access to your body and soul. Know ye not that to whom he yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Romans 6, 16. Satan wants to bring death into your life any way he can. Sickness, disease, poverty, shame, depression, discouragement, and all sorts of other nasty things. Why give your enemy an opportunity to come against you? As a Christian, you don't have to live holy in order for God to accept and be pleased with you. However, your actions and attitudes do determine how you get along with other people. That's why it's still to your advantage to live a holy life. Okay, so this idea that um, the the law makes you sin more by causing you to lust for the very thing that's forbidden. It's just like when you tell a 16-year-old that they can't date. Well, that's just adding fuel to the fire. They're going to find a way to date somebody, even if it's under your, under your nose or behind your back, right? So, when, so the purpose of the law isn't to tell you, this is right and this is wrong, follow the law, because you can't do it in your flesh. It's to say, this is what the perfect standard is, this is what wisdom says that you do, but at the end of the day, you still have a free will, and you're going to have to just deal with the consequences of whatever that choice, whatever side of the law you choose to be on. Uh, so the purpose of the law was the law made sin come alive so you'd recognize your need for a savior. It effectively removes the deception that you could ever get rid of sin on your own. So that is putting the law in its rightful place. The law wasn't given for you to follow it. I mean, yes, you're supposed to follow it the best you can, but it was never, the expectation was never that you'd actually be able to fulfill it completely. It was just a guideline for right, right, right living and right behavior. Can I just, you know what, when I think about this, when, once you got born again, did you want to do the dumb stuff you did before? No. Mm -hmm. And when you do it, you're like, why did I do that? Because you're not, the flesh isn't trained all the way, and we still mess up. Right. 
but get so free to think we're forgiven. You know? Oh, that's great, I'm perfect. So am I. Yeah. In my spirit. <laughs> All right, so we're going to read this last section, and then we'll be done for tonight. Because this section is just Andrew giving us up kind of his personal, he's relating to this material from a personal perspective, so it ties in. It's a good place to end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just this last accidental holiness. Accidental holiness. Knowing that I can relate to God based on the perfection, holiness, and righteousness in my spirit has set me free from sin, not to sin. In my flesh, I'll never be completely perfect until I receive my glorified body. Yet in the meantime, I can go ahead and relate to God based on who I am in my spirit. This makes my relationship with him stable and secure. Ooh, read that again. Like that. <laughs> I can okay, yet okay. In my flesh I'll never be completely perfect until I receive my glorified body. Yet in the meantime I can go ahead and relate to God based on who I am in my spirit. This makes my relationship with him stable and secure. That's really important because when I used to um, fall short in different areas, I would think that now God's withdrawing from me. And it wasn't God withdrawing from me, it was me with it was me withdrawing. Because I was thinking in my mind that he's no longer pleased with me, so I'm walking away. But I thought that it felt like I fell short, now God's not, he's frustrated with me or he's disappointed in me. And so now I have to work extra hard to um, regain that relationship again. And now I know that's just simple, that's simply not true. This is so liberating to know that my relationship with God is stable and secure. Completely disassociated with my performance. This is, like, this is a huge, huge revelation. I've lived a holier life accidentally than most people have on purpose. <laughs> Whenever these truths are taught, people wow. criticize, saying, you're just preaching this so that you can live in sin. You can't accuse me of that because I've never spoken a word of profanity, drank liquor of any kind, smoked a cigarette, or even tasted coffee in yeah, all my life. It's too heavy. Coffee. <laughs> I'm not saying that coffee and booze are the same thing. There's scripture for drinking coffee. Mark 16, 18 promises, if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. <laughs> I'm just telling you that people can't look at me and say the reason I preach this is because it allows me to live in sin. No, I live a very holy life. I don't live holy because I have to, but because I want to. I don't do it in order to obtain God's blessing. I do it because he's revealed this truth to me and changed my heart. I desire to live holy because it's good for me. It helps me minister to others better, and it's, hap it's happier to live holy than unholy. God would still love me if I lived in sin because my spirit has changed. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't love me, and other people wouldn't either. Sin offends God, but it also offends people. If you're truly born again, he'll deal with you as his child based on your born-again spirit. But God won't love you if you steal from them. If they catch you, they'll throw you in jail where you suffer. Be confined and hurt. You won't have a nice life, as nice of a life, but God will still love you. You'll still be righteous, but you'll also be stupid. <laughs> I'm not trying to be harsh, just blunt. Mm -hmm. Living holy doesn't make God love you more, but it does increase your love for him. Likewise, a lack of holiness won't cause God to love you less, but you'll definitely decrease your love for him. Although God's love for you doesn't change, your performance directly affects your love for him. Can you see now God's purpose for holiness? So that's a really important point. Living holy doesn't make God love you more. You can't manipulate God by your holiness or your holy actions. He's not moved by your behavior. He's moved by one thing, and that's, is Jesus in you or isn't he? And he's moved by your faith. We know the word says that too. But living holy doesn't make God love you more, but it does increase your love for him. The more that you are in communion with someone, the more you appreciate them and you value them. Likewise, a lack of holiness won't cause, you to love, won't cause God to love you less, but it'll definitely decrease your love for him. So... When you're out there acting like a punk, then you withdraw from your relationship with God. God's not going anywhere, but you are moving away. And it does affect your relationship, and it does affect how you can receive from God, or basically it shuts down your ability to receive from God. 
almost like a teenager with a parent. That's right. You know. That's exactly right. So before we end for the evening, I would like to review your pop quiz because I think we've gotten through a couple of questions now that we can look at. Oh dear, if I can find mine. You are a sinner saved by grace. False. How do you fix it? In the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay. Amen. How do you fix the sentence? There's one, one grammatical thing you can fix to make it true. You are not a sinner saved by grace. Okay. That's also <laughs> correct. What, what did I get over here? You were a sinner. You were a sinner saved by grace, yes. Two, true or false, poor performance, sinful actions, or behavior will send you to hell even if you are born again. False. 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 Very good. God can only forgive sin after you confess it. So long as you continue to confess your sin immediately, you are saved from hell. False. False. Why? The sin was forgiven at the cross. Yes, once for all. Past, present, future. We just covered that tonight, right? Yep. Amen. True, false. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. True. 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 Okay. That's right. And why? Because we are his righteousness. Right. Your spirit is the same as Jesus' spirit. Yeah. Yep. So what's so the only difference between the success that Jesus experienced and the lack of success that we experience is it's in direct relationship to the degree in which you renew your mind. Right? Okay? Mm -hmm. True, false, as a born-again believer, you are not subject to any consequence of sin because God does not hold your sin against you. False. 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 So somebody unpack that, because it's a half-truth, right? Mm -hmm. As a born-again believer, you are not subject to any consequence of sin because God does not hold your sin against you. Is it true that God does not hold your sin against you? Yes. Yes. That is true. But does that make you not subject to any consequence of that sin? No, because the law does hold it against you. Right. Amen. That's a tricky one. You guys got that one right. <laughs> I even underlined that part. <laughs> Um, I don't know if this one, if we covered this one yet. Well, oh yeah, I think we did. To be saved by grace means you are free from sin and its effects. To be saved by grace means you are free from sin and its effects. False. False. It's a half-truth again, right? Mm -hmm. um, true, false. The purpose of the law of God is to help you overcome sin. False. Why? Yeah, that is correct. Yep. Are you even able to overcome sin? No. 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 Not in your flesh, anyway. Right. How you, true, false, how you live has no effect on your righteousness if you are born again. True. True. That's correct, because your performance has nothing to do with your righteousness. You've been made the righteousness of God, separate from your performance. True, false, the law of the Spirit has set you free to sin. False. 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 That's right. Good catch. That one was my favorite one because that one was really sneaky. <laughs> um, okay, true, false. The more fruitful your works are, the more obedient you are to the law of the Spirit, and the more God's love is increased toward you. False. False. Unpack it, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> the more fruitful your works are, that's performance. Mm -hmm. The more obedient you are, again, performance, mm -hmm. to the law of the Spirit, the more God's love is increased towards you. His love never changes. Yes. So God loves you totally separated from your performance, and your performance doesn't change. Remember I just read that it, mm -hmm. it, it, God's love is fixed and stable, no matter how much you do or how little you do? Okay. Okay, that's it for tonight. These last two questions are our next chapter must be. Oh yeah. Did anybody answer a question? Okay. Does anybody? Yeah. That one I did right. I had a couple of them because I read them like. Did anyone answer a question incorrectly and have to correct it now that we went over it? Not Judy. Only on the set of rules because I read it wrong. That's okay. <laughs>
<laughs> well, some of them were really tricky. Like you could have easily read past the two. I did. I totally didn't even see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, how many people oh. say that today? I'm a sinner saved yeah. by grace. Allie, do you know oh, more? Oh, I have passed three out. Oh, do you need? I did. They kept them. Oh. Are we? Pass pass I don't know what they down. were, so <laughs> I wasn't looking. Brenda. <laughs> She's got one, do don't you, Brenda? No, oh, here. Do you need another one over there? I have one. I don't. Here, Dee. Allie didn't make enough. She'll bring some more. She'll just bring some. Yeah, we'll wait. I don't need this one. I can easily print another one. It's not down to the bottom. I don't know. No, no, no. This is a new one, isn't it? No. Oh, it's an old one. Oh. But Dee Dee didn't have one. I didn't have one. Oh, you did? Oh. They went to your last. That was gotcha. What? <laughs> Jonathan, you a copy. All right. Be thinking if anyone has a testimony. We have four minutes left. We did good on time tonight. We covered a lot of ground. I'm so proud of you. Oh, that's because we didn't have any distractions from the peanut gallery. Um, well, who's the peanut gallery? Is that <laughs> is that is that is that is that and he's all yours. <laughs> You can pass it on. Um, if you have a testimony, though, I'd be I would be very oh, excited to hear it. What is that? He's her prize penis. He's okay. Okay. You want the prize penis? I can read it. And work. Right. And hide. Come on, somebody's got to have a testimony. You know I live on testimonies. I have to wait on mine. I okay, can't wait. Like, I have to wait a couple months. Couple months. Okay. Well, let's do communion, and I'll check back in with you. Um, can you hand me that? Can you reach that? Yeah. I'll pass the, the offering bucket in case you have a tither and offering to drop in. You can break your bread if you're a bread breaker. <laughs> I, that was on the chair. I have no idea what that was. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, that your body was broken on the cross yes. so that ours could be made whole and that we don't have to put up with anything in the flesh because you have made it all purified and righteous and holy and all we have to do is point to the cross. Yes. Because whose report will you believe? Yes. I'll believe the report of the Lord. Yes. Amen. We put you in remembrance of your shed blood that not didn't just cover our sins, but that completely purified, completely pure, purged all sin, past, present, and future. That is so exciting, Father, that the only requirement of the law that we need to fulfill is having Jesus as a part of our salvation story. And if we can point to him, that's all you require. And our relationship is stable and fixed on that one choice. Thank you that you've made it so easy Amen. for us. In Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you need a picker upper? <laughs> wow. The prize, the prize peanut. <laughs> Whoa. A jack of all trades. Once you get them, you can't get them back. I know. Who are you Thank could? You, you wouldn't want to give me back. <laughs> oh. Testimonies, anyone? Last call. I'll give you, I don't know if I told you guys this, but Tom was down in Florida, and our storm trucks were down there, and one of our storm trucks just started on fire. That was in a roll. And so anyways, um, it started on fire, it, it just burned it right up. He couldn't even get near it, it was so burned up. So Tom was in a state of panic about it because he was there, the truck in just a row of trucks decides to burn up. He is like, Diddy, I am here. I'm like, so? He's like, well, let me think I think I did something to that truck. I didn't do anything to that truck. I didn't go near that truck. And you know, he's going on. I'm like, Tom, stop. So anyways, so we prayed immediately. In the meantime, they had a fire marshal come out. They looked at the truck, you know. 
talked to Tom about the truck. Tom had just come in the yard. It was stormy. It was pouring down rain. He went into the house. He said it stopped raining. He went to shake a rug out and he said he could smell a smoke, like plastic burning. So he went to one side of the house and didn't see anything. He come to the other side and he seen an older gentleman's over there jumping up and down and he looks at the truck and it is just flames are just pouring out of the truck. So he runs over there with a fire extinguisher, of course, and he couldn't get near the truck. Well, anyway, so after this was all said and done, they, they called the insurance company. They sent somebody there within a week's time. It was all taken care of. We got more money then. They even expect, and Drew had just made the last payment. The truck was paid off the week before the fire. And um, anyways, so they got more money than they thought they were gonna get for the truck and it was settled. And Pastor and I prayed, cause I called Pastor, I said, okay, now you're gonna hear something, this is really weird. And I told her about this, that just a random truck, third in line, burns up. And Tom had to run out there and move trucks away from it so it didn't burn other trucks up. But it was just like third in line, it burned up. They don't know why. They think lightning struck it. That's in the cause. Mm. They're short in it. Oh, oh. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. And that's what we prayed. You would get yet even more. And it would get settled quickly. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Get what you say. Amen. Amen. All right then. Well, if there are no other testimonies or comments, questions, and concerns, then go in peace. Well, I don't know whose joke this is. You got to read this the that wrong way. Pastor it's Ken. funny. What? That was for Pastor Ken. Probably we're not. That was his. No, I put that there. Figured oh. you were going to be here.